much. Um, as you see already summed up, we have three modes in G4 now. So there is the default real space mode, which we all know and love, which uh, features these very accurate grid based wave functions, in which, due to its being based on real space, can be parallelized over real space, which is very efficient and scales up to many, many CPUs. Although it is at times a bit expensive because each wave function takes up all of space. Um, and as the system gets bigger, we also get more wave functions. So something scales in a slightly expensive way. The CIO mode is a way to obtain a quite efficient representation, particularly for large systems, by means of a basic set which is significantly smaller. So we use atomic orbitals plus some more functions, and then we get a much smaller Hamiltonian and everything can be diagonalized efficiently. It parallelizes pretty well, you still have some dependence on, 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 on domains, like in the, the the real case. Also, there are, one has to parallelize at times over the orbitals, which can involve some more communication. Also, the price for having a smaller basis set is that the accuracy, accuracy drops off. So this is a trade-off. Finally, we have the plane wave mode of deepness, which I shall mention here. Uh, it is very much like the real space mode, except plane wave is the NCRN and you see mentioned very nice properties, particularly with convergence, but you don't get the benefit of domain decomposition, so you cannot massively parallelize it. Anyway, uh, so regarding the localized basis functions, what we basically do is we say that the zero wave function is now a linear combination of some states which exist on each atom times some coefficients. These coefficients will be variational parameters, whereas these are fixed and generated before the calculation. Then we plug this into the equations and derive some new Kohn-Sharm equations, which end up being a matrix equation like this. You have a, a Hamiltonian matrix times some coefficients being equal to an overlap matrix because the basis is not orthogonal times the coefficient times an energy, then you have to solve this diagonalization. Back in the beginning, we implemented this, uh, Marco and I, uh, quite a few years ago, it must have been 2008, and also, um, so uh, thanks for Marco. Well, as I was saying, we get the advantage that our basis functions are low, and that means many of the operations that we perform, which involve the overlap of these basis functions, they only involve a small region of, region of space. Then we have a smaller Hamiltonian, so instead of using the big iterative solvers <coughs> in, uh, in real space and plane wave mode, we can use a direct solver, late hack, which just diagonalizes the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> this can be an issue sometimes. <laughs> Then uh, we have the further added capability of, of doing, for example, green function based transport in terms of, of this basic. Since it is small, we can, it opens some possibilities that are not readily uh, available in, in a large basis. So, of course, as has been mentioned at least once, uh, uh, there is a completeness issue that, that uh, we don't have a, a, a good sampling of all of space. We only have a pretty good sampling of the areas close to the atoms. Binding energies in particular tend to suffer somewhat from this law. <coughs> Although chemists, chemists tend to solve the problem by spending a lot of time generating really big basis sets which are very fine-tuned. This, this also takes a lot of time. 
And finally, there is this luxury in the grid mode that you can just double, that you can just half the grid space and double the number of, of pain waves and you get much higher position. Yeah, it's not so simple, but this will see soon. Just, this is very easy to use. You have to do some imports like everybody knows. And then we set up a system, and then all you have to say is that you want LCAO mode, and unless you really want to do something special, just choose double C and polarize. Otherwise, it will work quite like a normal pen position. So, uh, one of the things that has to go on before we can do it, all this, of course, is that you have to generate the basis set. So, the first thing is that we have the Kung-Chan equation for an individual atom. This we solve, and then we use the inverse PW transformation to to, to get pseudo wave functions out. And we have to get some wave functions that are suitable as a basis set. So if we just solve the problem, then we have some radial functions that extend practically to infinity. Then we need then we need to cut them off at some point so that we so that we they don't cover all the space. Right? So we put an external potential around the atom so that it approaches infinity at some range. In this figure we have the uh, uh, 4s state of, of and 3d state of iron and uh, they get cut off here and here if we define as a criterion that the orbital must increase by 0.1 eV in energy. So by fixing the energy with which the orbital should increase, we can we can get a sort of natural size of these basis functions so they are large enough to get a pretty nice description, but not overly expensive to put into space. Then once we put several atoms together, they, the wave functions will modify a bit and we need some more basis functions to, this, to describe this well. So, uh, aside from the atomic orbitals, which we have, which, which we obtained from solving the atomic equation, we have to add some more functions. And these we do, we call these double zeta functions, uh, the, or second zeta functions, uh, which uh, are basically obtained from the atomic orbitals by subtracting a polynomial from them. So they become linearly independent, everything is nice, but they're very simple to generate. Then we add a polarization function also, so if we have an, an S-type wave function, and a D-type wave, uh, wave function, then in order to have a somewhat better description of the radial behavior near the atom, we need also something with a P character. And this is why we have a polarization function. Uh, uh, for, um, generally, it's, it's, it's chosen as whichever angular momentum channel we don't already have on the atom. So once we have this, we can perform some calculations. We could also add a lot more uh, uh, basis functions, but th this is one of the big to-do things that we never really got to do that very well. Here we look at the quality of an LCAO calculation as measured by the total energy of an H2O molecule. And if we, if we do a single seat and only have the atomic hole, then it's way up here. It's a very high energy. Then if we add some more basic functions like the polarization function, then it quickly goes down and things become reasonably nice once we have the double seat of gold rise. So two orbitals per state, per valence state of the atom plus the polarization function. And then we can add some more, but this never really gets anywhere unless we spend some time actually optimizing. Since this is a developer meeting, it should. This is something that somebody might have some time to do. I don't know. Uh, uh, of course, the actual comparison would be to to, uh, to find a difference mode where we get a, a, a total energy well below 15 minus 15. So there is quite some way to go, but. Um,
also energy differences. If one if one subtracts two things, then they, then the difference will be much smaller. Uh, it still won't be that good. One can perform a correction by adding both orbitals in space so that the basis sets in different systems <coughs> correspond more directly to each other and thus eliminate some error. And there are functions for this, it's called the basis set superposition error correction. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's still difficult to get very good energy differences. So, uh, one of the things I would like to talk about is parallelization. Unfortunately, this involves mentioning which steps are actually required. So, what we start with is a density constructed from the isolated atoms. And then we calculate the whole charge by adding the atoms, and then we have to solve the Poisson equation for the artery potential. Then we calculate the exchange and correlation potential and integrate with the basic function to calculate a matrix of potential elements. Uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, 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 the matrix elements of the effective potential. So, since these functions are localized, this basically scales with the system size. We don't have to, uh, we, this only has to be evaluated in, which, in those regions of space where these functions are different from zero. The next step is to uh, construct a Hamiltonian basis from some uh, kinetic matrix elements of the, of the basis functions and the matrix we just calculated uh, and some atomic corrections. Uh, this is basically a order of order n. Then, after we have the, um, the uh, Hamiltonian matrix, we have to solve the eigenproblem. And here things start to get a bit scary, because this is a cubically scaling operation. So it will become much more expensive in large systems. After this, we calculate, so we calculate the, uh, the coefficients and the energies. Then we have to cal calculate the um, density matrix from the coefficients and finally we can use that to calculate a new density and then we just repeat that until we are done. So these two operations are the big problematic ones because this is a matrix multiplication and this is an eigenvalue problem. They both scale cubically and they involve these uh, matrices. Well, if we take a look at how calculations actually run, we have these different, um, uh, the previously mentioned operations that are, can be parallelized over different things. So there is the Poisson equation, density related operations, and potential related operations. They are basically parallel over, over space, whereas all the operations that involve um, these matrices are, must so, somehow be parallel over orbitals as well in order for it to scale well. So the nasty part is that this one involves both real space and um, orbitals because we have to evaluate these integrals of space. Other than that, the diagonalizations are purely, uh, <coughs> purely involve uh, the basis functions. And everything almost is parallel over k points, so I shall be going into details about that. If we look at how the how the uh, how the, how it overall <coughs> scales as a function of system size, here we have some tests and goal clusters. And we can see that these different operations scale with various powers indicated here, which are more or less close to what I claim. So uh, there are all the grid-based operations uh, which are mostly linear, and then we have the, um, the uh, linear algebra operations which tend to overtake after a while. And so this is, uh, this goes up to, um, uh, is it two or three hundred atoms, sorry, but it's, um, uh, it, um, 
once we get up here, things get a bit, uh, things quickly get out. So one needs very good network and so on. Uh, what happens here is that we switch on the parallel diagonalization using scalar head, which I'm going to talk about. So this is a quite important operation in the uh, in using the localized basis set. So uh, I have to say a bit more about this since I expect that many of you will go back and do a lot of this video. The idea is that uh, um, in order to parallelize well the operation on these big matrices, we use scalar pack. Scalar pack uses a special layout of these matrices called 2 d sizing layout. It means that the upper left chunk of the matrix really belongs on CPU number 0. And CPU number 0 also has a, has a few other chunks located in various places. Then there is CPU number 2, which also has quite a few chunks, and so on and so forth. And here we have, this is how we would like the matrices to be when we perform operations on them. So uh, and this, can be, this can be done with all of these uh, dense LCAO matrices. Then, uh, to the right we have a layout which we are forced to use, although we don't really like it. It's when we need to transfer something from which has two basis functions in the, in the indices to real space. Then we need uh, uh, access to uh, uh, between all basis functions to all regions. This requires duplicating uh, some amount of data temporarily. Basically, one has to transfer data back and forth between these two for every iteration, which is why it doesn't parallelize nearly as well as, uh, as the grid mode, where everything is nice big matrices. Well, so we have these parallelization modes there are the K points and the domains. and these are the first choices when we have to do some serious work. Then, as systems get really large, for example, uh, a few hundred atoms, then some of the arrays will start to increase in size uh, so much that it becomes a, a problem. Uh, basically, because this one is parallel, parallel over State over states only, so not domains. So once once there is a big huge zero there and this matrix is too large, then we have to enable band parallelization, which is otherwise less efficient. So and finally, uh, scalar pack can then be enabled taking use, making use of all these domain and band CPUs at the same time. So when you perform calculations, consider starting using scalar pack from about 30 atoms. It can be it can become a bit expensive um, uh, if you have if you use scalar pack um, uh, on different nodes unless the uh, interconnect is very efficient. So. Uh, This depends a lot on computing architecture. So, uh, as a rule of thumb, parallelize as much as you can over domains, and then a bit of bands, and then be sure to use it. That's how you do it. Here is an example where we do a domain decomposition of 2 by 2 by 4, and a band parallelization of 2. We have to read on this parallel keyword to figure out what comes in. But this is documented. And then you have to specify things for scalar pairs. Then, um, then it will run and everything will be nice. But the, the numbers of CPUs have to match together. So, uh, so the domain position and band parallelization have to match however many you have. This is just you have to set up manually. So, 
final thing I would like to show an application here, some of my previous work, which makes quite a lot of things in the LTIO basis. Uh, uh, so, say we, we are investigating a mysterious phenomenon and we want to, 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 to perform a huge number of calculations. Then, uh, what we, actually, what we are actually doing is studying the reactivity of oxygen on nanoclusters, particularly of gold. And then we have, then we, uh, have, then we have decided on this model where we uh, study um, uh, clusters of different size. So we start with one cluster, then we remove atoms one by one until we have cleared a facet. And then we continue <coughs> removing other facets until cluster becomes very small and then we can calculate the, um, the binding energy of oxygen for everyone and, they, and this would be very expensive using the grid mode for something like 200 atoms but with the LCIO mode this is a matter of two days on Nifelheim which many of you must probably be familiar with for all of this it involves an entire structure uh, relaxation of, uh, of a cluster of this size for every little point on the uh, on the on the graph here. So we show some uh, some uh, binding energies on ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silver, and gold, uh, which bind more and more weakly. Um, and very accurate by themselves, but um, <coughs> uh, I, I stress here that these trends are completely with, reproducible with um, defined difference mode. Uh, and the, the main conclusion of the study was that, that these, um, these clusters of noble metals have very strong oscillations in their reactivity that depend on certain electronic magic numbers where we have where the, uh, which come from an, a, a structure of the, a shell structure from the S electrons in the metal. There are those with a non full D shell that have a much smoother trend and are most likely determined by geometric effects. So this is seen very clearly using the, um, uh, with, with a sufficiently large amount of data. So sometimes, uh, Quantity can beat quality. <laughs> well, in summary, we have high fast calculations to perform in LCIO and it runs on very few nodes and everything is very nice. One has to be careful to parallelize things correctly and use um, scalar pack. We still need to work with on the Basis sets beyond us to polarize. Right now, that's pretty useless. Um, uh, someday, we would like to have some sparse iterative eigensolver, which will allow us to go to much larger systems. Whereas, right now, we can go up to maybe a thousand atoms, and then it gets very deep. Well, that about sums it up. Uh, thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Any questions? Yes. Well, you talked a little bit about the basis set. Could you elaborate a little bit more how you build up the basis set? So, what about diffuse functions, which polarization functions you use, for example, for oxygen? How good is the quality of your basis set? Is it more on a speed 21 level, 6 for 31 or 6? 31G. We've done very few, very little work on the uh, on the actual quality of the basis. So we haven't really um, compared to something like Gaussian, for example. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have these um, different types of basis functions, where some of them, uh, except for the atomic orbitals, the remainder are just constructed by uh, uh, choosing some nice parameters and we use basically the same parameters 
across all its inferiority. So this can be done much better. Not the same, not the same barn things. They are, they are, um, they are, they scale in a way so that uh, so that they correspond roughly to the size each function should have, but but it's it's not optimized by a limit. Would there eventually be a possible? I see that you have big problems setting up the basis sets. Would there eventually, as a, I as a user, would then prefer actually to take a basis set from a database, something like a Postgres basis set, where I know that they are well done and well built, and something like that? Would it be possible to implement something like that that I just take a basis set from a database and then use it in the LCAO calculation? Uh, unless the code you take it from uses the same pure potentials for PAW setup. This would be of little use, I'm afraid. Um, uh, it's 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 a direct visit for a basis set that mm -hmm. it is generated with reference to the zero potential mm -hmm. of the So this, unfortunately, would not work. Um, I would like to stress that we haven't done a lot of work on these basis sets, so I'm not yet ready to. That it's very difficult to make a good quadruple theta or anything else. It's just this is a developer meeting, so we should get things uh, in the light so people will take a look at them. Maybe somebody needs a project to work on, right? <laughs> so one more question here. It's at the moment. You don't want Gaussian basis, you want low-class basis. That's also something. Like that. 